list order. Um, Dominic Shodake Talaferro, that is your your full Facebook moniker. Um, but uh, I was introduced to you as Shodake, and um, so I think if folks cross you on the street, that would be an appropriate uh, moniker to, to say out loud to you. Yes, definitely. Okay. All right. Um, well, I really appreciate you joining me here today, and I have a million questions for you. And we talked a little bit yesterday off the record about just some backstory. Um, and I'm loose as to where this conversation goes. Like, I, I, I think I have a tiny agenda, but it's that we can go astray from that at any moment. Okay. Um, but uh, I kind of wanted to start with a couple big picture things. One, um, the Sun article that was just released, the, the Sun, was it the Sun Times? Is that right? Uh, the Baltimore Sun. Baltimore Sun, excuse me. Um, did an article sort of profiling you and your work um, as a way to sort of do some PR around the camera shows that we do and also pre, pre-party the Carnegie shows. And the article ended with, I'm glad I didn't kill myself when I was nine. And um, I don't know that we have to start there today. That's a heavy sort of trampoline to jump off of. But I just wanted to sort of stick that pin in the conversation as like, that was the catalyst for me to reach out to you to do the podcast was like, I, I think I had always been like, I want to talk to Shodake. I want to get to know him more. And then that little nugget that you dropped in there was like unlocked something for me. So um, we can get there. We can get to there. Um, but the other thing for me that was like where DNA was lighting up for me was when you was when Bismarck he passed away. Mm-hmm. And you clearly have, I mean, just in, in the way you've, you've talked online, you have a depth of knowledge about him that I clearly don't. And in the genre of music that he was sort of at the forefront of, you know, in the 90s and the early 2000s. Um, I was in college. I was at Ohio State and I was just sort of, I'm away from my parents and nobody can tell me when to go to bed. And then all of a sudden, you know, uh, oh, baby, you comes on. And it was like all I got it off a of Napster. Like it was like. That was I, during the Wild West of like where you know people started stealing music and not paying for it. Um, but anyway, I'm just kind of curious. Like, can we? Can you start with like Baby Shodake and maybe get to where you bumped into Bismarck Key and sort of got into the vocal art thing, and then we'll go from there. Yeah, um, man. So I was born in Washington D.C., raised there. And then also raised in Prince George's County, Maryland, mm-hmm. uh, a county right outside of Washington, D.C. And, um, man, uh, you know, as a kid, I, I was, and I, I maintain that all children do this. They naturally use their voices to enhance their imaginary environments, right? the that veil between what's real and imaginary is very 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 thin for all of us as children and for some kids there is no veil they're all part of the same experience and so with that said um like all kids i was making sounds with my voice to illuminate this imaginary environment um that i was playing in and exploring um all of my possibilities and so making sounds with my Transformers and, you know, my G.I. Joe figures and things of that nature. But um, with hip-hop emerging out of the late 70s through the early 80s, um, I was exposed to uh, some of the first generation beatbox pioneers and innovators that, uh, was, that were building their reputations and their craft in that first emergence of hip hop. So Dougie Fresh in the movie Beat Street, um, Darren Robinson from the Fat Boys, uh, Buffy the Human Beatbox in the movie Crush Groove. Um, I first started um, exploring my possibilities of using my voice as a vocal musician by being exposed to Dougie Fresh and Beat Street and Buffy and Crush Groove. Um, so then fast forward. Oh, sorry, sorry to interrupt show. show the, um, you mentioned a few things there again that were like, oh, like I, I recognize it's just interesting to me. How, like I was introduced to the Fat Boys by there was a movie called Disorderlies. Right. That came out after Crush Groove. Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I you, you're more knowledgeable about the chronological order of this stuff. But like, I, I don't know. It's just dawning on like, how were you? I was exposed to it through a silly movie. You know, but like, how did you, and a good movie, like, listen, I don't know, the movie was good because, because it stuck in my craw and like, you know, I would go watch that movie again in a heartbeat, but like, what, how were, 
how were you introduced to this music? Were you, I mean, you're you're playing with Transformers, you're doing G.I. Joe, you're doing, you're doing things, but like, who was the first person to be like, hey, check this out? Were you at like a party, a house party? Were you hanging with your folks? Like, what was the, how that was, happened? Uh, the, the cinematic experiences of those movies, uh, oh, okay. of Beach Street and of Crush Groove. And through that exposure and through the exposure of other Beatbox classics like uh, Lottie Dottie by Dougie Fresh, The Show, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the Human Beatbox by the Fat Boys, um, Stick 'em by the Fat Boys as well, featuring Darren on uh, beatbox vocal percussion. Mm-hmm. You know, kids were experimenting with breaking, with um, graffiti art, with rapping, with beatboxing. Um, so around 86, I got into my first opportunity to demonstrate what it is that I could do because after seeing Crush Groove I, I I was beatboxing all around the neighborhood and you know with other kids and at the babysitter's house and so we were up the street at this uh at the house of these other kids and this other uh boy there said yeah I could beatbox and then some of the friends that I was with said you could beatbox too. Go ahead and show them what you got. Show them. You do it all the time. Practice. You practice all the time. Go ahead and, and show them what you do. And they were egging me on. And the other kid was like, yeah, let me hear what you got. So I demonstrated just a little bit of what I could do at the time. Mm-hmm. And then he said, yeah, okay, you could beatbox. And that stuck with me, you know, just that feeling of, oh, I got validation from someone else who can do it. Mm. And that always stayed with me. So then fast forward um 1988 1989 uh Bismarcky's single The Vapors produced by Marley Marl there's this brief segment where Biz does some of his uh vocal scratching through the vantage point of beatboxing um and that part stuck with me as well because I remember I was having a uh it was my birthday weekend and I had a bunch of my friends over for a sleepover and the video came on, and so we're all up watching the Vapors video. Mm-hmm. And um, one of my friends said, oh, this is the part when he does the vocal scratch. This is the part when he does the vocal scratch. I love this part. Watch this, watch this. And then Biz does it. And to see that that validation and approval from a friend of mine, without anyone else in the room demonstrating it, but watching Biz do it in the video was just another moment that stuck with me. Like, oh yeah, wow, that is kind of crazy. Oh, that is really Mm -hmm. insane that he did that. Um, And then underneath the surface of, you know, playing with my friends, um, experimenting with music and using my voice, I think beneath the surface, all of that was this unconscious reservoir of resourcefulness that was building inside of me due to uh, the abuse that I experienced as a kid. And I think very unconsciously, I was using music, my voice, the vocal arts, and even more specifically beatboxing to sort of take the essence of my body back, Mm. to take uh, to to reclaim uh, this this form that we refer to as the human body, which is a vessel for so many other powerful inspirations and influences, and um, you know, Karis One, the author of the Gospel of Hip Hop, um, a text that I'm reading through right now, um, he maintains that hip hop came into the world as a form of musical and cultural intervention for oppressed peoples if i'm not a living testament to that i don't know what i am um and i i am very inclined to agree with that and i think that that was my experience growing up as a kid by way of biz buff dougie um you know it's it's, it can't be a coincidence that at 43 i still feel charged to reclaim my body through this form of um vocal instrumentation bodily instrumentation Mm. um and even more specifically to put a note on it in terms of inspiration and reference um that really loud snare sound that biz can do it's a a resonating rim shot snare that he produces by an articulated inhalation at the molars of his uh mouth of his oral cavity um 
I first got that from Biz. It was very mm. indirect, but that's that's one of my most powerful snare drums. Um, and it sounds like. <laughs> When I do that into the microphone, it resonates like you would not believe. And mm-hmm. Biz is uh, resonating rim shot. He's even more powerful than mine. But I got that from him. And so it's oh. just, it's 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 really inspiring and humbling to, to be able to draw those uh, connections in terms of direct influence and inspiration. And mm-hmm. I maintain that Biz was essentially one of my grandfathers in terms of uh, influence and lineage. Well, can I, I mean, on that, t- and pardon me throughout this whole conversation, if if uh, anything I'm asking comes out clumsy, um, uh, just the way you're talking about, like, the development of your instrument um, as a reaction to abuse that you personally and oppression that, you know, and, and so I just want to ask this question, like, the way you were describing the environment in which you were sort of I don't want to say pressured, but pushed into performing for the first time. Yeah. Just reads to me as somebody, you know, as a, uh, I'm just going to say it, like as a white kid from a cornfield who never, who had different issues, different things I was thinking about, but the way in which I was introduced or made to play in front of people was a more controlled environment where it was like, it's a solo and ensemble competition in your middle school band and you're going to play a snare drum solo in a room where there's going to be a judge and your parents are going to be sitting over there and your teachers over here and you're going to get a one or two and you're going to get a medal. And it was like a very sort of like, uh, institutional safe way to get into feeling of like, what is, what, what is competition, but also like, what is performing? And the way you would describe your experience struck me as like highly confrontational just on its like merits. Like do it, do it, do it, do it. Can you do it? Can you do it? You well, said it you was, could do it. It was confrontational in a way. Yeah, but it was more encouragement than it was confrontation mm. because I didn't battle the other kid. Yeah, yeah. You know, it was just like, show me how you use your six shooter. Let me show you how I use my lightsaber. You know, it uh-huh. was it was maybe a little bit confrontational and competitive, but it was mostly it was a, a communal environment. It was it was it was community based, you know. Mm-hmm. We weren't even at school. We were hanging yeah. out in the neighborhood, and a bunch of us were hanging out in this kid's basement. And he was like, "Yeah, I can beatbox," and he did a little bit. And I was being all shy. And then the other kids I was with was like, "Man, go ahead. You do it all the time. Go ahead. You show them what you do." And um, you know, it was it was, yeah, it was it was it was very. Uh, very community oriented mm-hmm. that experience it just um, feels like a very yeah. healthy way of saying put up or shut up like it, it's like yeah, sort of like yeah basically. like yeah <laughs> which can be terrifying like which can sort of like if, if somebody had just said put up or shut up like that can feel aggressive and like oh but like it just seems like you were able to cut through the bullshit and get to what it is you do a little quicker than I think maybe my experience was, which was like, it was years of like, Oh, I got a two on that solo and I'm hiding in my room upset because I didn't do well (laughs) thinking I disappointed my teachers. When in fact, like none of that really mattered. It was just the act of getting in front of people and doing things and learning about myself. You know, I was a 42 year old. Now that's something I'm more aware of, but Mm -hmm. um, do you, can you, can you tell me a little bit about like the development, what I know about like oppressed peoples and their reaction to oppression in the way that music manifests. I think I have a little bit of a deeper grounding in terms of how that happened in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, can you talk a little bit about, uh, again, this is just some assumptions I'm having, like if I didn't know anything about beatboxing except for what you told me about cultural oppression and stuff and the reaction to that, it would be, oh, in the way in Trinidad, musical instruments were actually banned. Like they were like, you cannot play your traditional African diaspora instruments in public, Mm -hmm. Um, like all these things. And so there was a like, well, we can do they didn't they they didn't say we couldn't play bamboo. (laughs) So they went into the forest and got bamboo and sort of redid everything. And then later on, they they couldn't tell us we couldn't play trash so we can play a steel steel. (laughs) You know, is is the development of of a fully functional instrument from something you don't have to pay for? you don't have to buy is with you all the time. Is that something that kind of grew? Is that, is that part of the calculus? Is it a, like, why not, why not just play drum set? 
I guess is my point. Right, you right. know, I guess okay, that's my question. So, oh, great question. I love the way you frame that. So I've never been to uh, to Tobago before, um, but basically, um, I've never been to Trinidad or Jamaica, um, but I can't speak to how the oppressive experience of racism, white supremacy uh, manifests in this part of the world. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's a book uh, that I've read um, and a, a body of knowledge that I've been studying for the last few years. Um, there's a text called The United Independent Compensatory Code System Concept, a textbook workbook for victims of racism, white supremacy, mm-hmm. written by Neely Fuller Jr. Um, and one of the main nuggets that I take away from his um, counter racist code or uh, mm-hmm. body of codification is this. Uh, racism, white supremacy manifests through four stages or develops itself through four stages. Establishment, maintenance, expansion, and then refinement. So by the time we were coming out of the civil rights era of the 1960s, early 70s, um, coming out of Vietnam, the Vietnam War, uh, coming into the deindustrialization of American cities, through the mid and late 70s, um, hip hop began to emerge. Mm-hmm. I think we were also experiencing some of the first stages of the refinement stage of white supremacy, right? Mm-hmm. And so instead of saying you can't play, instead of these systems of oppression saying you can't play this, you can't play that, they were simply taking them away from oppressed peoples um, and the culture of hip hop emerged as a way of um, experimenting and exploring with reappropriating our ideas um, of music and our collective unconscious network of experiences of musical expression and experimentation. Um, And so it, it became much more elusive, you know, instead of saying, don't play this, don't play that instrument, don't play this traditional instrument, don't embark or continue these uh, traditional practices. It was, okay, take out this school, this music program out of this school, mm-hmm. take this music program out of that school. Mm-hmm. And so it was a different experience of uh, counter-racist reappropriation. And to me, that's what hip-hop and beatboxing is so much on so many different levels. Mm-hmm. Um, and instead of reappropriating... Um, the turntables, which many DJs did from Grandmaster Flash, African Bambada, and uh, Cool Herc, and so on and so forth, and so many countless others. Um, some of us, as we were, as we were being raised by hip hop, um, were more drawn to reappropriating what some would argue to be the first instrument within the human experience, the human body. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, just like in gymnastics and dance and the martial arts and virtually any and every form of bodily instrumentation um you know and the practice of wing chun you're learning a whole new system of codification based on reappropriating the human body to be this counter force Mm -hmm. of simultaneous attack and defense um for self for the purposes of self-preservation um beatboxing is uh very similar in that regard. It's simultaneous um, articulation, um, consistent inhalation and exhalation patterns um, that are sustained for the expression of a full polyrhythm. Um, So we just very unconsciously uh, reappropriated the body into a human drum machine. Um, some of us, like Rozelle, the godfather of noise, formerly of The Roots. Or no, he's still down with The Roots. I don't know. But anyway, Rozelle, mm-hmm. he says in uh, a couple different interviews, and Buffy the Human Beatbox as well from the Fat Boys, they, I've heard them both say in interviews, in separate interviews, couldn't afford a turntable, couldn't afford um, a drum machine. So I started 
express myself through um, this form that we call beatboxing because not everyone could get the DJ equipment at the time mm-hmm. of hip hop's first emergence. Um, even to a finer point, speaking from own, my own personal experiences, at the age of four, I remember being at a department store with my family and I looked up, I saw a trap set and I said, that, I want that. Can we get that? I want that. I had, I had my first moment of a deep, um, ma- magnetized inclination to mm. do a very, very, very specific thing. And playing a trap set is a very specific thing. And um, Robert Greene talks about it in some of his works. Um, in his book, Mastery, he talks about those primal inclinations, you know, mm-hmm. those things that you feel drawn to. At the age of four, I had my first experience of knowing what I wanted to do, and it was playing the drums. And they said, no, we're not bringing home no drums for you. So fast forward um, to about age eight or nine, I find my own drums in my own way. Um, so, you know, that primal inclination found its way somehow mm. um, through another manifestation. Um Damn, that was a bit long-winded. No, no, no. That's it. Was great. I mean, uh, you answered, you answered the premise of my question. Um, but it, but again, I think your answer was great because it just gave me more. I have more questions. But I, but I don't, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, I need to. We'll do that on the po- on the second podcast. I mean, some of this is just my ignorance of like my observation. Like, there's I can only observe the oppression I see in Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, or in terms of the historical oppression, I personally, the, the truth is, is like, yeah, I grew up in a cornfield, but I, it's impossible for me to truly, truly know and understand all of the deep nuances here because, mm-hmm. you know, just my lived experience has not really involved it in the way that it has for you. Um, but uh, I'm curious, the, as you were talking, there were the words reappropriation were, you, you use that a lot. And what I know, what little I know of the hip hop, like with sampling and DJing and all that stuff is constantly using other people's stuff, but only in a way like it's different person to person because once you use, you could take a Bismarck key album, cut it up and Mm -hmm. sample it. And there's a point at which everybody's going to listen to it. And if you haven't done a good enough job, people are going to be like, Oh, you did a bad version of Bismarck key. (laughs) <laughs> you know, um, but if you if you take if you take a you know take the Mona Lisa, chop it into fifty thousand pieces, rearrange it. <laughs> at what point is it no longer Da Vinci's? At what point is a Bismarck key tune no longer Bismarck keys, and you've done something new with it? Where even Bismarck key would be like, I don't even know what the hell you were doing, but awesome. Like <laughs> how I think those conversations of how you use other people's work for influence for. Uh, actual content within your music. I mean, George Crumb is a composer in the Western classical world who has literally just sampled Bach, you know, uh, a Bach invention or a Bach prelude or something and or chorale and just literally note for note sticks it in there. Mm. And he does it in such a way that it's like, whoa, that was a crazy, you, you, he sampled in the same way that people are sampling Clyde, Clyde Stubblefield, you know, like from James Brown, he sampled Bach. It's just other people, you can do it well and you cannot do it well. You know, like in in the hip hop world, though, how are those ethics sort of negotiated? Is there sort of an under unwritten rule that you can tell when you can tell a bad comic is sort of rewashing someone else's joke and sort of putting yeah. it in their own? You're just like, ah, come on now. Like, how is that dealt with? <laughs> how how are those particular ethics dealt with in the in the it, at least in the community that you, you you run in? Man, it's such a beautifully complicated. Um, dynamic and construct of creativity and expression man where do i even begin so i guess let's start with me so um beatboxes are basically the human samplers of the world or the the human vocal samplers of the world um and last year when i was on tour at the lash i read a book i was reading a book while we were on tour um by a colleague of mine, Dr. Anna Abraham. Uh, Mm -hmm. The title of the book is The Neuroscience of Creativity. Mm -hmm. And the main thing I took away from reading that text was that 
So far as we understand it, human creativity is by and large highly associative. And so we emulate, we take, we appropriate, we, we mimic, um, and then we filter countless limitless inspirations and influ influences mm -hmm. through the vantage points of our uh, creative fingerprint, essentially, because we're all unique. Um, in our own uh, ways, but you know, it's about staying true to who you are, who you are, and then allowing the largely associative uh, elements and, and dynamics of human creativity to filter through who you are as a unique individual. So um, I think it comes down to how, as a beatbox or a human vocal sampler, um, how you best interpret um, and and take in these influences that you're emulating with your voice and then filtering it through a whole new uh, way of seeing uh, the same thing that you saw before. Um, in terms of uh, hip-hop sampling, in terms of the ethics of it, um, like, uh, Take a Personal by Gangstar, right, from their album Daily Operation. Uh, the second verse of the song, Guru, talks about... Um, how you can't really accuse someone else of biting just because they use the same sample. You know, it's about how you hook the sample up and use it in a way different from how the other person uses it. Now, if you use the sample the same way, then yeah, that's biting. But countless people have used impeach the president. You know, uh, countless people have sampled uh, Parliament Funkadelic. Countless people have sampled um, from... Uh, one of the most phenomenal uh, manifestations of human creativity, um, the, the sacred crates. Uh, essentially, the sacred crates are the very records and breaks that were used by DJs to build the cultural foundation of hip hop. Um, Man, who references the... Uh, Jazzy J references the Sacred Crates more than anyone else I've seen thus far in my mm -hmm. research. And the first time I learned of this, it, it blew my mind. You know, there's a catalog of specific records that were used to build the very foundation of hip-hop culture. That's mm. that's a, a major dissertation on so many different levels. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so Impeach Your President would be in the Sacred Crates. Um... Apache, uh, but an incredible bongo band. That's another one of the sacred crates because that sample has been used countless times. I mean, as a kid, but, sorry to interrupt. I mean, as a kid, those the Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five, Sugar Hill Gang, yeah. those were the records that filtered down to me in Dover, Ohio. Like when I went to my local, I think it was called Fye Fyi. Yeah, like it was a little record shop in the shopping mall. Like you could go, and it's like the hip hop section had three records and it was sugar hill gang, you know, and it was like the late, the latest, uh, who was it? Like Luke it was like a rapper L U I think just L U K E Luke, you know, it was like that. And, you know, maybe a Snoop Dogg album, you know, but sugar hill gang. <laughs> and you know, I, 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 I memorized the entire rapper's delight. And I was like the only kid in my neighborhood who could do the whole thing. And I was like this weird point of pride, but I had zero relationship to the hip hop community. I was just like, this is, this is like a good speech. This is a great speech. And mm -hmm. I, you know, just like you listen to any great orator give something. And I was just like glued to that, that boom box. <laughs> listen to just like, wait a minute, what's going to a holiday Inn? what are you talking about? Like, <laughs> you know, like all these things. Um, but you know, the, the moment for me when appropriation uh, in a bad way, sort of when I was aware that that it was something that could be done poorly was Vanilla Ice. That was the other record <laughs> that, it, 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 listen, you can just mute me here and you don't have to hear me talk about Vanilla Ice, but the argument over uh, Ice Ice Baby and Under Pressure, the David Bowie, you know, and his argument being like, no, 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 see, it's bum, 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 bum. And you're like, <laughs> even as like a 16 year old kid, I was like, that's a that's a bit of a specious argument there, Ice. I think you're you're you're, you're reaching a bit here, um, and so like that's why I'm so curious because you listen to you listen to the the bongo band or you listen to Grandmaster Flash like they're sampling too, and they're it's just they're doing it at such a high like it's it's a it's something that I think and this is sort of leads me to this other question like yeah you teach at a university now at Towson and you are 
you have a real academic approach to sort of how you catalog all of these things and how you're constantly cross-referencing and in your head, uh, you know, this thing comes from this and now I'm with Suyin Leah and we're talking about Tuvan Throat Singers and like you have this amazing catalog in your head. Do you ever imagine a time at a university setting like at Towson where somebody could come in in the same way that I majored in percussion music, uh, some, somebody comes in and they're majoring in, the vi- in violin, they come in, they have a shitload of etudes they've got to play over the course of four years. There's just nuts and bolts, things you, there's scales, there's techniques. Could you imagine a time where there's a course that is like, that like if Bismarck, he was 20 years old now. Yeah. I could totally imagine him within the next five to 10 years, based on my judgment of where the university systems are and their, their, their accessibility and acceptability of other art forms. Five mm-hmm. to ten years, I could totally imagine a Bismarck he being, you know, an adjunct professor somewhere, you know, only coming in just to teach his technique to students, you know, like, or yeah. like, could you imagine I mean, that ever being a thing? God, I mean, well, let me see if I could thread those two questions together. Sorry, and also just to throw in the third part, do you want that to be a thing? Because I there are some, time, um, some things where once an institution grabs a hold of it, yeah, yeah, the yeah, validity yeah, yeah. can sort of get sucked so, out of it, you know. Man, okay, let me thread these three things together. So, I believe that uh, sampling ethics, I think they may not evolve over time, over the period of a few generations, but they may transcend over the period of a few generations. Mm. Um, case in point, if you look at any of the uh, the sample sources. Um, I won't say where or how to look for those sample sources because I do believe it's an individual journey for each person, each listener. Thank you. But if you trace those sample sources, sample sources of someone like Pete Rock, for example, mm-hmm. you will see that this man has brilliantly, brilliantly sampled from three or four or five different records from four or five or maybe three different eras. One record will be from 1967, not from a rock mm-hmm. record. And then another sample source will be from a 1972 source from a completely different genre, from a jazz record. And then, you know, the third and fourth sources will be from the 1950s and from a doo-wop record. And it's like, mm-hmm. wait, how did you do that? Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think that appreci- appreciation augments the transcendence um of the the sampling ethics you know i think Mm, over mm. time um beyond the controversy beyond um whether or not the the payment went to that particular artist or record label um which they should um i think there's an appreciate an appreciate an appreciation over a series of generations that's to be cultivated um because i maintain that um the hip-hop practice of sampling is one of the greatest constructs of human unification that exists on the planet. Um, Because within that construct, no record is safe, but any record can be creatively used in a manner that's powerful, that's transcendent, and that's really, really quite beautiful across genres, across eras, across artists and practices. Mm -hmm. Now, take that reference, referencing Bismarck E., not only was he a master beatboxer, pioneer, and innovator, but he was also a master of records. Um, African Bimbada is known as the master of records, but I do believe that there are other master of records, Jazzy J being another one of them. Hundreds and thou- hundreds, hundreds of thousands of records in his collection. And Bismarck, he, I don't know how many he had in his collection, but he's known in hip hop culture as a master of records and some of his breaks and samples are just so creative and so brilliant. Um, I could, you know, it's funny if I were to imagine Bismarcky in a university setting, I would, I would imagine him teaching a course on the history of sampling Mm -hmm. um, and creative applications of sampling first and foremost, before even him trying to put together a beatbox ensemble. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of the other beautiful things about Biz's legacy was his presence on Yo Gabba Gabba. Um, And I think his presence on Yo Gabba Gabba teaching um, children how to beatbox through Mm -hmm. that program was another testament to... um, one of the main elements of 
of hip hop serving as this construct of unification because just as much as opera, tube and throat singing, beatboxing possesses this possesses this uh universal oh my god factor, right? Mm. Um but beyond the universal oh my god factor, there's the question of wow, how are you making those sounds? And then beyond that there lies the question of how are you emulating this reference or this sound with your voice? Um, again, and human emulation, vocal emulation is a universal human practice. Mm. Um, and it's an ancient practice. Uh, I think human emulation was one of the first forms of vocal communication that came along before speech. Um, to me, it makes logical sense. I haven't done enough research to make that claim and embed it within a dissertation or anything of the sort, but it makes a lot of sense to mm. me. Um, and so beyond that, imagining biz within a university setting, again, referencing Karis one and the temple of hip hop of which I am a student of, um, he argues that hip hop should be taught at the university level. It should be taught within university settings. But it shouldn't be someone who's never been in a battle. It shouldn't be mm-hmm. someone who's never, you know, experienced the blood, sweat, and tears mm-hmm. of cultivating their contributions to hip hop. It should be a practitioner of hip hop who are in those settings teaching the elements, the forms, the culture, the history this- of hip hop I- as it is. Um, so it-, it shouldn't be someone who graduated from. I don't know, uh, Harvard, who never lost a battle or won a battle or had, you know, released a a, a hip hop record or released or or never had to, you know, get their fingers dusty and dirty by digging in the crates, searching for samples, whether Mm -hmm. you're sampling them or not, you just feel this passion, this this urge to be embedded in the culture. So the the professors and the the educators and teachers of hip hop within a university setting should be the practitioners themselves. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of in full agreement with KRS one on that one. I mean, it's, 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 I feel weird being in a university setting, which is why I feel really great about my reference um, as innovator and residence, Mm -hmm. because um, I was just explaining it to someone the other day um this platform allows me to fuse um the unruly nature of being an artist with the the discipline of an academic um mm-hmm. form or construct and you know I, it allows me to be in some ways in some ways even more uncontainable well, Whew, i just threaded all three of those points together no, you did, did great. a good job of doing that you did fantastic and it's uh, <laughs> one of the things that i that <laughs> That I, I get bummed about when people talk about like academia as this um, inherently bad thing because it's structured, highly structured. Um, I think if you use academia as a place to actually have to sharpen your, your axe of like, what it, how do I talk about what it is I do? Because yeah. I've got students for 41 minutes and I have to get across to them. I can't just come in and be like, feel it. It's like, no, no, no. Actually, show me how you suck air in towards your molar. <laughs> like, you know, that may, that may take an entire 41 minute class. And like, that's good. I think for us who live often in the chaos of the art world to have to come in and think about how we distill down what it is. We, and you actually learn more about why you do what you do when you have to talk about it to other people. Um, but the thing I, I, I agree with your point about the, or the, the point you were reiterating uh, from someone else about the need for it to be a practitioner because here's something else that that martin schmidt from matmos clued me into because matmos i don't know if you're familiar with them much they live in in baltimore Mm -hmm. that they they were sort of the first people that i was in front of who i could smell them and see their hair color like face to face who were actively involved in sampling and knew a lot about electronic music mostly from like european western 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 europe like uh like darmstadt that sort of vibe but they were you know they they know all the references you know too. And Martin Martin Schmidt told me one day, he's like, you know, I wish people knew how big of a nerd Dr. Dre is. Yo. Right. And I was like, what, what I was like, what do you mean? He's like, and Snoop Dogg and all those. And I was like, what do you mean? He's like, if it's one thing to sample something. But the other reason to have like Bismarck in the room showing these kids how to sample something is because he needs to show them how to edit that clip 
so you don't hear the clips of your samples. Like that's a yeah, mastering thing too. That that is a mastery of being able to sew together a Clyde t- uh, Stubblefield drum beat or whatever, so you don't hear clip clip you know every time because you did a shitty yeah. edit. That is part. <laughs> that is a factor in Bismarcky's genius and in Snoop Dogg and in Dr. Dre is that they're going to sit here and toil over Pro Tools for like, you know, a reason or whatever it is for way longer than Snoop Dogg is drinking gin and juice. You know, like that's like y'all I'm, I'm being I'm being glib here, but like I think we gloss over in the educa- in the academic setting a lot. We see the videos with Snoop and Dre and all, and all these folks, or you see the video with Bismarck Key, but you don't see the exponential amount of hours that they spent staring at a computer screen and yeah that's i think that's important because then otherwise people are just like well i i'm gonna sample like snoop Dogg," and then you just have a bunch of shitty samples out there that (laughs) that aren't edited well you know like and then you've missed the perhaps one of the more important things of their skill set yeah the the level of work and dedication and discipline that is uh that naturally manifests through hip-hop is it's beyond anything. And, you know, it speaks to um, another one of my favorite phenomenons, uh, the, 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 either the individual or the collective uh, phenomenon of those who are self-taught, of mm-hmm. autodidacts. And um, hip-hop is one of the greatest examples of countless self-taught practitioners, developers, innovators, pioneers, teaching them, themselves these systems of codification, you know, sampling is largely experimental, but it's also highly codified. Beatboxing is very experimental, but extremely codified. And it, it, it boggles my own mind, but it's also a lot of fun to see a boggle the minds of academics mm-hmm. when they, like, for example, uh, in the first few years of playing music for the dance department at Towson University, how did you learn? How did how did you figure out? Like, did you go to school to learn? In other words, I feel like they were saying, "Well, hip hop is this ghetto ass culture. How did you manifest something that's so codified?" But um, that's for me. That's one of the greatest mysteries and mm-hmm. one of the greatest um, powers of hip hop is that it's this. I was raised by multiple generations of autodidacts. And they were learning how to build their skill sets, but they were also the, the the auto the nature of being the autodidact was also very community oriented again, mm. you know, within hip hop, and it's well, just such a beautiful thing. I mean, it's it's a very similar form of how the steel pan was created yeah. by the uh, creators of the steel pan and Trinidad and Tobago. I mean, they were teaching themselves, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, and this is a conversation that. I think is dovetailing now. And I think in ways that it's important to talk about, I mean, this, and it came up a little bit in our collaboration with so um, between so and you um, uh, Vodality is this piece that we've done two movements of we're working on the third. Um, like I'm just, uh, let me just ask out loud. You, you don't read music. Is that correct? Hell no. Right. So, <laughs> you know, um, there is a weird, just to call balls and strikes here there. I think when people have like, wait a minute, how did you do what you do? I, I think it's less, I'll say from my experience, it, it, yeah. my viewpoint, when I act like that or I have a reaction like that, it's absolute, well, it, I can't say it's not because of racism, but that's not, <laughs> I, I can say for me, I'm not looking at someone being like, the steel drum is a ghetto ass instrument. How did you possibly <laughs> get in this room with me? It's more, it's a, it's just purely a found, a fundamental insecurity of like, wait a minute. I know damn well that you, you're surviving in this room, but I know that if I was in your room, like if I was in, you know, in your neighborhood during a battle and I would have Z, well, not that I wouldn't have any agency, I would just, I'd be lost. And you, I think sometimes, and in Trinidad is the case, I go there, like, I, I can I can sight read a panorama tune, you put it on a music stand, I can play right with the band reading it without ever having practiced it. And they'll look at me like I'm some wizard, you know, but eh, I can't do what they're doing. And that insecurity, which is like hearing the two, an eight-year-old can come in and hear the song once and get about half of it, note perfect. And then mm. they just hear it again and they get the other half, you know. 
that insecurity is hard for me as a 42 year old to deal with, but it's something like, I'm wondering now, like how much, what is, I feel it's a deep responsibility that we codify your music and put it down on paper because it will be around 400 years from now and people will know about you in this piece. Whereas if it lived in the, the autodidact world solely and you taught it to us all by rote and we never published it, like, I don't know, that's the, that's the ethical quandary for me. Right. Where, where ethics so, come in yeah, here. Yeah, great point. So um, over the last several years, um, I developed my own system of notation, actually, mm, mm. Um, that I refer to as beatbox algebra. Mm-hmm. And um, the notation uh, for vodalities that you have down on paper, mm-hmm. <clears throat> I want to um, adapt that to my own system of notation mm. as well. Cool. And uh, basically ha- have both versions uh, fully uh. published. And preserved uh, specifically through my archive and maybe other places as well. But um, my whole idea for beatbox algebra is this: <clears throat> uh, my notation system is rooted in um, vocal percussion articulation tenets and basics, um, paired with um, consonant references and uh, numerical references. So the system is fused between uh, n- numerical sight references and consonant sight references. Um, it's very, very basic, um, and yet extremely dynamic because when I teach this system, um, I instruct it in such a way that you're learning some of the core basics of vocal percussion from the Mm -hmm. vantage point of beatboxing, but then you're also learning the basic tenets of the notation system. And so by teaching both to the same class of students, um, the two systems start to reinforce one mm, another, right? Mm. And then the at the final stage, um, I have the same students um, compose their own vocal percussion piece or micro piece and also develop and codify and adapt their own notation system based on the basic tenets that I mm. taught them. Mm. So they're stylizing their own vocal percussion concepts which is what each student is supposed to do anyway. You have to make it your own. Um, and then you stylize your own notation system. Mm. So that, and the, the larger end game of teaching both and creating a feedback loop between the, the articulations and the system of notation is used to diminish any internalizations, any and all internalizations of math phobia. Mm. of a fear of math. Mm. I was raised in an environment where I, I, I was so scared of math. I still have that internalized. Mm. And so it's been my way to reclaim my relationship to mathematics mm. and beatboxing is extremely mathematical. Sampling is extremely yeah. mathematical. Breaking is extremely mathematical. Um, and so that, is been, that has been a form of math phobia therapy for me and mm. hopefully to others that I, I teach the system to. And so sort of being really, really stubborn and not wanting to learn Western notation because over the years, a few, people, a few people have said, oh, you want to compose, you need to learn Western notation. And I'm just like, ah, fuck all that, fuck that, fuck that. I don't want to learn it. Because it just, I feel constrained. I feel contained by that. And hip hop is supposed to be uncontainable. And so in response, I developed this system of notation. Um, And not only that, I'm trying to teach it in such a way that people can learn um, that they don't have to be afraid of math, which is a universal phenomenon. I think the way that mathematics is taught in most academic settings sucks. Um, Math phobia definitely oppresses uh, the black community, black children. Um, well, in math, you know, what I know from my friends, some of my friends who are in math, like math, and and lots of composers in in at least in this in So's world are ex uh, like physicists and, and scientists. Like, interesting. Like uh, or or psych psycho- or not uh, philosophy majors and people who are like <laughs> who think about stuff and like math is incredibly creative. I mean, yeah, at its absolutely. core, it um, can be. It, well, at, at, if, at its nature, it, I think it is. Yeah. 
Well, uh, mathematics is what it is, but then the way that you use it can be so creative. But mm -hmm. the way that it, it's taught in most uh, academic settings is just fucking terrible. I, mean, yeah. I hate it. Well, so. as you were talking, I mean, uh, I I feel like the thing I'm learning about notation, whether I mean, uh, do you, have you looked at George Crumb's scores at all? I have not. Yeah, I think if you just scores? yeah, well, uh, they're yes, but in his own way. Like it's not you'll you'll see it. You'll be like, oh yeah, that's you know a staff with notes on it. But the way he he lays it all out is very visual, and it's like his pieces sound the way they do because of the way he lays them out. If he just scored it all out in Sibelius and spit it out, like it would. I, I don't know. It's very unique. But the other style of notation is called Laban notation. Do you know that? Oh yeah, for Through, dance for, movement for, and choreography. Yeah. And it's like, they're all just different languages. And I, I think it's, I think like, I guess what I'm saying is I agree. I don't think you need to learn French, but I think it's, I think it's, <laughs> but I would say for history and for, for, uh, conservations, conservation, uh, purposes of your music, I think it's important to have your music translated into French by someone else so that, you know what I mean? So like have it in all the languages, have it in your beatbox notation, but also, for fo some kid in Iceland who's like, man, I saw this video of so playing modalities. I'd love to play that piece on my recital. They can also pick up the piece and and do that. Well, here's also part of the uh, the creative pushback from my vantage point. Mm -hmm. um, as this piece continues to develop develop legs, um, you know, with both paradigms of notation as a reference. Um, and they can say no or say yes if they're really interested. But I'm hoping that there will be some schools, some students who say, oh, damn, OK, I want to get mm. into transcribing the piece for myself or yeah. for my group. Um, oh, man, what's this other notation system that Shodake is using? Oh, well, then. Huh. Wait a minute. Maybe we should create our own notation system. And I feel like that's where the true mm. empowerment comes into um, is is pushing back against it should only be within Western notation as yeah, the major yeah, reference. Yeah. I don't think there should be any one major reference. Um, I think to me that's power dynamics and 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 um, power ethics start to enter the conversation yeah, yeah. at that point. If it's only conserved with and preserved within one notation system, having multiple options and then inspiring people to create their own notation systems based on whatever basic or simple or advanced um, applications are at play. I'm like, for example, whenever I've taught beatbox uh, algebra, it's, God, it's so incredible and so fascinating to see how people adapt the, the basic notation system that I teach them, adapt it to their own uh, codification system. I swear, you you know who the mom is in the room. You know who the engineer is in the room. You know who the philosopher is in the room. When you mm -hmm. see them adapt it to their own uh, systems or created systems of notation, um, it's as if to say, um, at its core, mathematics and notation should be filtered through your own individual creative fingerprint. Um, Every single time, I swear, you know, it, it's it's always done in a unique manner. And I think we, uh, in a way, I, I want beatbox algebra to be an advocate for that. Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, you can learn notation, learn whatever notation systems that exist, but most of the world's music doesn't exist in Western notation. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know? <laughs> well, and it's it's one of the things as a performer. I mean, I I compose a tiny amount relative to everybody else, and so and and of course, and certainly you. But um, it's one of the ethical problems that I'm kind of trying to chew on as a performer of like what, as an advocate for someone else's music, um, like yourself, for example, or David Lang or Caroline, whoever it is that we're playing. I what bubbles to the surface for me quickest is less of a like. Um, play at this piece because this this music is awesome but play this piece because this person's awesome yeah. and i just want this person i want you to have an existence in in the historical record for as many people as is humanly possible and um that i think though just to admit out loud i think that sometimes clouds or puts up a little bit of a smoke screen between me and what 
your actual desires are <laughs> you know <laughs> like i'm just like put show decay in a spray bottle and spray them everywhere and you're like actually i'm fine with just being over there you know like and, and so like or or i'm fine with it taking a little slower because i want this notation thing's really important so anyway that's 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 where my agenda i think sometimes i need to check myself a little bit and be like <laughs> you know yeah of course notation of course notation isn't a hill i'm gonna die on but in terms of like if i have a choice of of somebody being able to just type in uh so percussion if i have a choice of having your score pop up 200 years from now on whatever search engine they're using that's a choice i'm wanting to make now um just because i've seen in our field, I see so many things just fall through the cracks, and it's for no other reason other than it's not written down. You know. Well, here's the other beautiful thing about oral tradition: um, it begs so many more questions in terms of really, truly testing one's imagination, yeah. either individually or collectively. Mm -hmm. um, there's no way hip hop would have been born out of a system such as Western notation. That's just because you know these our own systems of codification, they had to be developed from a, a base that was rebellious at nature. Yeah, yeah. And and not only that, um, there is a, uh, a beautiful thing that happens in terms of um, social transference. Um, when social transference, cultural transference is the, the primary uh, route of communication and generational transference, um, the people who develop them become, well, maybe not industrially, but at least culturally, there's a, a stronger reinforcement in terms of who the gatekeepers are, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and, you know, it's, and, and beatboxing has migrated all over the world, you know, and, and, and you could argue that um, videography has become a 21st century equivalent to notation because there are countless videos that we all have studied from. And mm -hmm. um, some of these uh, beatboxers from all over the world, younger generations, I mean, some of the stuff they're doing is just like absolutely insane. Um, so clearly the internet has had a huge impact on the evolution of the technique. Um, but uh yeah, I think there's there's something to be said for um, the the nature of it being that much more elusive. Um, I mean, it's all really beautiful and, and, and complicated, but, um, you know, I like, and actually to bring a full circle in terms of sampling, uh, can I just say, I was telling this to Jason, I said to him, damn, has y'all's music been sampled a lot? Or whatever, because I listen to every single one of your freaking albums, and I've heard countless breaks, mm -hmm. countless potential samples, and it's just like to me, it's the ultimate compliment. Um, and I mean, put in the hands of the right uh, ears, the right producer, the right DJ. I mean, there are a lot of breaks in Soul's music, a lot well, of breaks. That's... I'm just like dying, like yo, will somebody fucking sample the shit, like? do I have to sample myself? Like, sample me, sample me. <laughs> but it's just like, I, I don't well, know. I don't know if you've heard it, but I've, well, I've when I was at Caramore, I listened to all the albums. I was just like, man, there are so many beautiful breaks in here. And there, we, well, I'm just going to admit something to you. And this may be like the biggest faux pas of, of, <laughs> of, of an artist that any artist can do. And you may just close this zoom meeting immediately. But years ago, um, this is probably six, seven years ago. Uh, we were just traveling a lot and I was on planes all the time. And so I decided I was just like, I'm going to remix amid the noise. And so oh, like, cool. so, I, you know, but I, I did like three tracks and then, so we, the, everybody in so took a track or two and we just did like our own, we just sampled ourselves and did a, did a remix of the album, which is like, you're already going like, uh Oh, mayday, mayday. <laughs> no, 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 not at all. But it's like, it's some of it was like, wow, that was really cool. Um, that was, it was really fun to do. And I think, I think it's up online somewhere. And if you ask Jason, oh, wow. he could probably okay. send it to you, but I would, I mean, we would be honored. I mean, it's, it's something that we've never actively thought about, but it would be, I mean, I don't know, show, do you know people, you know, <laughs> you, you, know people. Yeah. you, you know, more people in that world than we do, I think. So, um, um, yeah, I know some people who would, do some really wonderful work uh, sampling uh, so's recorded music as you know the sample sources um, like the project that Royce the Five Nine and DJ Premier did together as Prime. Um, I'm blanking on the composer's name. Um, he did the soundtrack for Black Dynamite. 
Um, and the challenge for DJ Premier was for him to sample from one artist's catalog. And he was like, one catalog? Like, what do you mean? Um, but he rose to the occasion and he found so many different sample sources from just within one uh, person's catalog. Mm. Um, and he did an amazing job on uh, that album. That was the uh, the focus for the first Prime album. I don't know if he did that for Prime too, um, but yeah, it was a really interesting way to sort of relook at uh, sampling. Um, but yeah, I just um, even on the new album with Caroline Shaw, um, the song that you have on her on the album with her, the duet you have with Caroline, mm-hmm. that was really dope. A uh, really beautiful Thanks. song, and uh, Thank you. yeah, uh, yeah, it's it's just really interesting uh, stuff, and even just to have like I don't sample by way of uh, record collecting. I do collect records, but I, sampling is not my uh, focus. Mm-hmm. Clearly, uh, beatboxing and and other vocal arts are, but um, I always have a, an ear for potential samples. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's just a refreshing way to sort of look at the world of music because. Um, God, I remember, and I, I think it was a Rhythm Roulette LP of Company Flow had an episode on there, mm. and I believe it came by a, a Beethoven record. So the whole idea is, is that they go into a record store blindfolded, and mm-hmm. then they have to grab three records, take them home, and and find potential samples and make them work, whether they mm. like the record or not. So he, he came across a, a classical record, I think it was Beethoven, and LP was like, you know, turning his nose up like, oh, God, Beethoven, like, man, Beethoven. And then, but lo and behold, he found a really beautiful break in that record. And so that process, that experience, it, it forces each and every potential listener um, into a, a constructive space of reconsideration, mm. you know, whether you like it or not, or whether, you, you know, like I've heard countless uh, producers and DJs say, I was looking at this record I didn't think there'd be anything on it, but this well, white boy from American came through. Well, the the thing through with the break. <laughs> the thing too that like like that just like again like the the initial reaction to Beethoven is like oh, Beethoven like or when you talk about Bach, not you, but like when people talk about Bach, you think like oh the wig. It's like okay, stop for two seconds. Bach had like twenty three kids. <laughs> had a a gig every Sunday where he had to write a new mass. An hour-long piece every Sunday. And you're wondering why he came up with figured bass? That's the modern equivalent of the real book, my friends. Like, like <laughs> this was a guy with a gun held to his head and 23 kids screaming their heads off every day when he walked to work. You know, like Beethoven. <laughs> Be- there's a great Radio Lab episode uh, that uh, Caroline Shaw and a string quartet she's in participated in, it, and it's about Beethoven and his tempo markings. There's a par- there's a practice around pe- uh, performing Beethoven now where most things are under tempo, way under tempo, mm. relative to what Beethoven marked. And the story is is that his metronome is broken. Oh, uh, sure, possibly, or he was going deaf, and the way for did it ever cross anybody's mind that Beethoven was smart enough to realize his metronome might be broken? But that also in order for him to process the music that he was wanting to hear, that seeing energy on stage might have been part of his calculus. And so part of this Radio Lab episode is they went back and played Beethoven 5 at the sort of standard performance practice tempo. And then they slowly worked up to where Beethoven wrote it. And bro, it is fucking rad. <laughs> They're all hanging on. It's like, like just ripping. Hmm. Ripping. So they sped it up on the uh, the turntable. No, no, no. They played it. They were physically. I mean, I mean, yeah, uh, on the turntable. Right, and so anyway, just to say, like over time, we've sort of sanitized Beethoven to be like, oh, his metronome must be broken. So like, his music has gotten easier to play because we've never wanted to play it the way he wrote it, you know. Mm-hmm. And I think like if you if we saw beethoven in that light if we saw bismarck in that same light if we saw like in the context of their time doing what it is they're doing it would be less hard for people uh, just to bring it to the the first thing we started with it would be way less stressful for a 9 year old kid <laughs> to look at a person like bismarck or beethoven 
you could look at those folks and see something in yourself. If those other, if the backstory was more pre- prevalent than just, oh, he wrote Beethoven nine, you know, or he yeah. wrote, oh, baby, you like what's, what's all that, you know, all that backstory. And, and, and that leads me to this, like for you as a nine year old, just to bring it to the quote at the end of the, the Baltimore sun article, yeah. um, you know, are you, how comfortable are you talking about your, your battles with suicide and sort of like uh, what you've been thinking well, about? Well, now that the story is like out there. Well, you uh, said it, bro. You did actually say it. So <laughs> the story is out there. I mean, but it's, just, fuck. Okay, so let me bring it back to earlier of this year. Uh, early winter 2021, I'm in the throes of establishing my living archive. And... Um, I'm looking at other legacies and other uh, living archive examples throughout history, right? And there, there are not many, actually. Um, Buckminster Fuller mm-hmm. uh, had his own living archive um, throughout the 20th century. Uh, he was way more obsessive with it than, than I am with mine right now. But um, when I learned of his archive, and which is now being uh, preserved by, I believe it's Stanford University, if memory serves correctly. Just for um, the record, I'm not ignoring you, show. I'm just writing everything you're saying. Uh, right. I'm taking good. notes yeah, here. Uh, yeah, fact check, all of that stuff. Um, so I was reminded of reading about Buckminster Fuller and Mastery by Robert Greene. Uh, another thing you should know about me is that I'm a huge book reader. I'm a mm. huge bibliophile. I, I love to read um and uh as i have read mastery by robert green twice and buckminster fuller's legacy is referenced um in that text um and specifically his um what i refer to as his uh ideation epiphany as he was uh deep in the throes of his ideation his uh deep consideration of taking his own life um he heard a voice Buckminster heard a, heard a voice that said, your life doesn't does not belong to you. It is not your own. It belongs to something much larger than yourself. It belongs to the universe. Mm. And through that, he thought to himself, I should dedicate my life to the cultivation of my own human potential. And that's what he did for the rest of his life. And we saw, uh, history saw a vast turnaround um, you know, to bring it back to um, my own childhood, I remember seeing the uh, spaceship Earth at Epcot, at the Epcot Center of Walt Disney World when I was mm-hmm. a kid uh, mm-hmm. for the first time, 1988. Um, I just remember just being so amazed by the, uh, the architecture of that, that beautiful globe. Um, and I had no idea I was looking at the legacy of Buckminster Fuller because it was named Spaceship Earth after Buckminster Fuller. Mm. The designs were inspired by the innovation designs Mm. of, uh, Buckminster. Um, so, you know, and by 1988, I had come out of my first bout with ideation. So, you know, um, I'm going deeper and deeper into Buckminster's legacy and his own battle with ideation. And I thought to myself, fuck, I think I need to do the same thing with my archive and dedicate it to um, maximizing my own human potential, which beatboxing is all about. Hip hop is all about that. But specifically beatboxing, I mean, to pursue that oh my God factor is like the daily operation of the practice, you know, just as much as gymnastics, the martial arts, dance, It's about maximizing the full potential of the human mind and connection to the human body. Well, can I can I ask you real quick when when you say ideation um, to you, that word means what exactly when you say ideation um, to me is essentially uh, deep considerations of taking one's own life to the extent that you are potentially making plans you mm-hmm. are potentially uh rehearsing uh the process um the uh, the thoughts and the considerations begin to become much more externalized um even a little bit ritualized uh to a degree and i had ritual <laughs> rehearsals with it at nine years old 
um, again in 2004 and then a, a little bit uh, in, in 2020. Um, but the most intense was when I was at nine, actually. That was the most intense um, struggles I had with ideation. Um, in and some the- ways, I think I was crying out for help. Mm. And, and I think in other ways, I was seriously considering, um, you know, this as an escape. Um, and so, which is why I decided to take that term and make it um, embedded deeply within the title of my living archive at Towson University. Um, the title of it is Ideations of Potential. Mm. So again, that's another hip hop practice of taking a term and flipping it, turning it into something else, turning it into something constructive, something positive, something empowering, you know, so it's not the title isn't ideations of suicide. The title is of my archive is ideations of potential. Well, one of the Um, things that like that's uh, just I won't go into too many personal details because it doesn't. It involves other people that I, I don't have the permission to specifically talk about it. But suicide and attempts at suicide are have been in my family and mental illness has been in my family for as long as I can remember. I didn't know that it was mental illness at the time, um, mm-hmm. just because the stigmas around it in the 80s when I was a kid were much different. You know, in my experience, um, suicide is a very private thing that gets that usually people, although it can also be, how, how did you deal with it? In my experience, folks have, it, it can be embarrassing. Um, it's something that you feel like you don't know. Literally nobody else in the world is, could possibly be thinking this way. So like it, it can be this very isolating feeling. And I'm curious if yeah. for you as a nine year old, like what, how was that man like what were those feelings like for you as a nine year old uh there was angst and utter frustration and feelings of despair and uh anticipated emotions of relief of knowing that i would be okay on the other side Mm. um and then um as i emerged out of that battle um even during that battle actually i emerged um more creative than uh i had ever been prior i had the exact same experience um post college 2004 my second battle with ideation um my my the the battle was coming to a close in 2005 and then in 2006 I went full steam ahead into uh, pursuing a path of being a professional musician, specifically through beatboxing. By the fall of that year, I was doing it full time. I had become more creative than ever before. Mm -hmm. Um, And then same thing coming out of the battle of it in 2020. um, And then um, 2021, I've become more creative than I ever thought possible through my archive, through working as a composer, through my position as innovator in residence at Towson University, but at a at a at a deeper um, existential root. <laughs> Just a few months ago, I realized um, something really transcendent and and frightening and beautiful. So I had a what I refer to as an alignment epiphany, and I realized that every single cicada season every single cicada emergence in my life 1987 2004 2021 i'm either struggling with ideation or i am struggling to address suicidal ideation and you know it was just uh just i I just i'm left speechless even referencing that um and just recently, actually, um, with the, the story, the cover story of the Baltimore Sun, which illuminates my professional journey, my personal journey, um, I, I took a copy of that paper and I brought it to the, the, uh, to the archive, at my living archive at Towson University. But I also brought um, a set of cicada wings that I saved, and I also placed that in my, in my archive. 
Um, and apparently me and the cicadas got something going on. I don't know what it is. It's really fascinating and freaky and inspiring and transcendent. And I am just preparing for the next cicada emergence um, when I'm 62 years old. We're going to have kung fu training, weapons training. We're going to have a bomb <laughs> shelter. We're going to have canned goods. We're going to have, yeah, we're going to be fully prepared. Um, so it's just, it's just been another interesting revelation. And I've had countless revelations in 2020 2021 especially this year and um i think with each battle with ideation i responded with extreme create creativity just responded with okay how creative can i be to work my way out of this out of this deeply intense battle and so um with the story being released and published via the baltimore sun on monday i i so, okay, well, here's another thing. Let me show you this. So, um, this is uh, really uh, just frightening and really saddening and depressing, but also strangely humbling and maybe empowering. So, uh, so this is the, the cover story. Mm -hmm. This is the physical print version. And um, above my story here is the story of these two children who did not survive their child abuse mm -hmm. and were found murdered in the trunk of a car. Um, and so I wrote the, the author of the story and I said, can I get a meeting with the editors, please? Because I just have tons of questions um and she wrote back to me and she said yeah that was a very intentional editorial choice that they made um to draw con drastic contrast between uh tragedy and hope mm. and um i guess in other words they were trying to say this is what happens when you don't do something about child abuse this is what happens when someone decides to do something about child abuse uh, so well, what advice? I mean, yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, no, yeah. no, no. I, again, I'm I'm terrified to interrupt you because this. I just want to hear your side of things. But uh, the you also described a process that to me feels felt very like your nine year old self, and and I don't. Uh, that's what you've described most in terms of how the ideation manifested later. I'm not sure if you approached it the same way as you did when you were nine, but there was s serious planning, which tells me that like when you plan for something like you rehearse you have a ritual you take it seriously this isn't a random like you're going to the store to get milk and maybe you'll grab a pack of gum when you're there like this is <laughs> you know and in my experience it's like you you know i know folks who have you buy the gun you buy the bullet you don't buy a whole you don't need to buy a whole you don't need to buy 75 shells you know like or you buy the Tylenol PM you buy you know, like you prep your you know, and there's a, there's rehearsal for it. Yeah. And to me, you're describing something that feels like, I just want to say, it feels like you really dodged a major bullet for whatever reason. Like, did you, it feels like you did it all by yourself. Like there, like, and I don't want to presume that's the case because I'm sure there's other people in your life who helped you bounce out of it. But it seems like you took the suicide thought as seriously as you took beatboxing and everything else in your life, which is why you didn't do it flippantly. I'm sort of just aligning it with other values I've heard you speak. And I'm curious, seeing you now, you're how old now? 40 what? 43. 43-year-old version. You're only a 43-year-old version of your nine-year-old self. Yeah, right. You're not exactly. actually a different Absolutely. person. And so, like, do you look at that time as a nine-year-old did is anything I'm identifying accurate or am I way the fuck off base? Because no, 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 absolutely. Uh, you know, because oh man, so that some of those people who did help me more than I even realized that they were at the time. I'm trying to find these people so I can invite them to Carnegie Hall. <laughs> <You> know? <laughs> I know, man. Listen, it's... um, the people who were messing with me at nine, like they're not getting invited, uh, but. Yeah, you. I, 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 I did get a lot of help directly, indirectly, but ultimately I had to make the choice on my own. I mean, the choice was mine to make and I, I made the choice. But, you know, I also in some ways did a deeper dive into 
Okay, so another thing uh, a lot of people may not know about me is that before becoming a musician, even as a kid, I wanted to be a filmmaker mm. or I wanted to have some presence in uh, the world of film. Um, so there are certain films that I, I exposed myself to uh, that I think helped me along in a lot of ways. Um, I think I was cultivating my own sense of film therapy or cinema therapy at a very, very young age. Mm. Um, and so take a movie like Purple Rain, by example, for example, which deals heavily with suicide and suicidal mm. ideation. Uh, Prince's father in the film, who just recently pa passed away, Clarence Williams III just passed away uh, just a few months ago. I think those sequences in the movie Purple Rain might have helped me and inspired me more than I ever could have recognized at the age of nine, you know? Um, but looking back as an adult, I, I see how I, I think that film helped me in a lot of ways. Um, another great example of uh, a narrative that deals directly with suicidal ideation was the movie Lethal Weapon. Um, might be a corny reference for some people. It might be a, a really powerful and inspiring and inspiring reference for others, but um, if you go on a YouTube and watch that uh, ideation sequence in the movie Lethal Weapon with Mel Gibson when he's in this trailer and he's rehearsing and then it goes from rehearsal to serious consideration, if you look at the comments section on YouTube of that sequence, man, it resonates with so many people. It's really powerful and really inspiring. And from what I understand and from what I've read and researched, um, Richard Donner, the director of that film, um, he sort of approached the, the filming of that sequence in a really mindful and, and, and a thoughtful way and really stepped lightly around the, the filming that, of that sequence. And, um, you know, he would approach Mel Gibson one day and say, hey, how are you feeling? You, maybe is today the day or okay cool no problem no pressure or maybe the next week and then one day mel gibson came to him and said you know what i think i'm ready to do the scene so as i understand it it was just him richard donner maybe one other camera operator maybe one other assistant a very scaled down crew they filmed the sequence i think maybe they did only one or two takes don't quote me but mm. from what i understand uh richard donner uh the director wept after they filmed that sequence. And I think that was another powerful um, moment of uh, self-cultivated film therapy that I think was helping me at the time as I was struggling or coming out of my first major battle with it. And, um, you know, if I'm in, I, I think that film still helps me through it actually as an adult at 43. So um, yeah, I, those two films, Lethal Weapon and Purple Rain, <laughs> Uh, major references have very special places in my heart in terms of the way that they addressed ideation. Um, and then Prince's final, uh, one of his major final sequences in that film where his father is carried away in a stretcher from attempting to take his own life. And now Prince's character is struggling with ideation. And then you see him fight his way through it. And then he discovers, <laughs> going back to notation, he discovers his father's music that's notated. And then he uh, comes to a place of calm and collapses mm -hmm. and he feels reinvigorated and re-inspired by this beautiful, elusive and yet tangible phenomenon that we call music. Uh, it's just a really powerful sequence. Um, and so, yeah, I think ideation is way more out there and the zeitgeist of human experience and human culture than we realize. And I think uh, it, it, someone just the other day was talking to me about how they have battled with it. And I, I just, from that conversation, I came to the conclusion, wait, this is something that exists on a spectrum. You mm -hmm. know, there's a, there's ideation at the basic level, then there are, there's ideation at the extreme level. And and for black youth of this country, um, it's an epidemic, a silent epidemic that has uh, just worsened and risen like over 70 percent, according to the McSilver Institute of NYU since 1991. Um, and so I, I have no idea what I'm doing with this, but I'm just trying to find as many creative ways as possible 
to shed light on this epidemic for black children of this country, of this world, and for all children, no kid should be struggling with well, this is One of the things that, so, that yeah. No, one of the things that came to the forefront when So did the gun show project a couple of years ago was this was in 2012, I think the gun stats, or 2015 maybe, the gun stats were like, I think 31,000 gun deaths in America in, in a year. And then when you dig down, like 20 of those, 20,000 of those were suicides. You know, mm-hmm. some crazy number that like when you hear those numbers and you're like, oh, my God, gun control or oh, my God, there's gang violence or oh, my God, oh, my God, whatever. Like there's a school shooting and 26 kids die and it's like and awful. But whenever you aggregate it and look at the whole thing and you see that the vast majority of gun deaths are people who at, are at their end of the rope. And for whatever reason, decide to end it. And I, you know, um, the, the, the little experience I have with it was a was a family member who wasn't successful. And for him, he was sick of Lou Gehrig's disease. And for him, it was literally the last way. It was his last bit of power that he, control he had. And to fail at even that Mm. was because he wasn't physically able to like do it. Again, like when you talk about the spectrum, there's there's people who are sad and depressed um, for whatever reasons, are oppressed for whatever reasons, and decide. But for some people, it's the only way and to retain any self-respect about your life. And so we as a, we as a society and as humanity need to swallow that too and understand that like the more nuanced sort of views we have of ideation – of understanding that when someone is planning something like this, the reason they're taking it seriously is because they failed at, or they feel like they failed at everything else. Mm. And to fail at this is, is un you can't recover from that. If you can't even kill yourself, you know, like that is part of the equation. I'm not, again, like it, I don't ever want anybody to feel that way, but it's part of it. And like, and so whether it's a nine-year-old kid who's dealing with abuse, um, who's dealing with whatever things you're personally dealing with, um, I don't know what else to say other than I, I wish more folks had nuance and were able to not be scared away by suicide. Of like, oh, no, no, let's not talk about it because it's too terrifying. It's like, yeah, it is terrifying, but how do we make it less terrifying? How does that nine-year-old kid, how does the 43-year-old show okay? not be terrified of this and talk about it, you know? And so I guess this brings me to my last, my last question for you, because I've already stolen an hour and 30 minutes of your life here, Shota K. Um, <laughs> it was some pretty heavy shit here at the end, but what advice, I know you, you mentioned that you, you marched right over to the uh, mental health facilities at Towson the other day. Like, yeah, what did, if, if, if there's a nine year old Shota K or a 16 year old Shota K or whoever out somewhere and listening to this and is like, man, a lot of what he's saying <laughs> really jives with me. Like, what, what do, would you, what advice would you give to that person to take to do in the next four hours after hearing this? Oh God, I don't even know, man. Uh, um, well, I just, I'm still trying to understand what it means for me in terms of sharing my story, and so that's why, for now. Uh, one of the best things for me to do is reference uh, the legacy of Buckminster Fuller, who dealt with it directly and decided to um, maximize his human potential instead. Um, but you know, but that's a, also a very, very personal and unique thing for each individual. Um, and I maintain that we live in a society that doesn't want us to maximize our human potential. You know, they want us to be distracted. We, they want us to um, not be focused on our, our, our developing our skills set um, to such an extent that you begin to be able to help other people. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, like the last thing I ever want to do, like case in point, I, I don't ever want to be in another beatbox battle for the rest of my life. I, at 43, for me, I, I'd rather demonstrate my skill set um, in front of a, a 
population of, of children, of adults, of whoever who are who have dealt with ideation or who are currently struggling. So yeah, I I uh, I would say hold on, don't give up. Um because life will wind up surprising you, um, just as it has for me. Um there's no telling what's coming around, uh, coming around the corner, but you know, um, like referencing the sequence in *Purple Rain*, uh, if uh, Prince's character had not fought his way through that battle, um, he never would have found his father's music that was notated. Mm -hmm. um, if uh, Mel Gibson's character had given up, he never would have found his new family, which is what his character really wanted. He lost his wife. Um, the film doesn't dig too much into his, uh, his childhood past, but it seems to imply that he might have been raised in an abusive environment. And clearly he was traumatized by his experiences in the Vietnam War. But, um, you know, Danny Glover's character became Mel Gibson's new family. And essentially all we're looking for as people are, um, foundations of, safety and, and and empowerment that's ultimately what we're all looking for um so sometimes your family is not your family sometimes your family is um are your co-workers or sometimes your family are is your community or your neighborhood or sometimes it's a family member who lives on the other side of the, of the coast um that you've never met um and sometimes it's a battle you have to fight by yourself, but if you can make if you can make it through on your own, there's nothing more empowering mm -hmm. than figuring it out on your own. Um, so I think I think in a lot of ways, uh, ideation uh, attempts to challenge the very human nature of being an autodidact, of being self-taught, mm -hmm. um, in, in, in a way that maybe has gone illuminated, I, but it. it it certainly strikes a chord with me, you know, being self-taught, figuring out how to solve your own problems, um, and then solving your own problems within a larger network of support. I mean, so that's why when the story came out, I, I went over to the, the counseling center at uh, Towson University and said, hey, this is the story that just came out. We got to figure out a way to work together to raise awareness. I'm, I'm ready whenever you are, um, because... At that point, it was just another reminder of this is about something way bigger than myself. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm just a small part of a larger journey. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I, as much as it's, as it's possible in a way that makes the most sense and in a way that's the safest for all involved, I, I want to use my music to help other people as much as I can. And so... Uh, if we can all figure out how to do that for ourselves and other people at the same time, there, there's no greater empowerment. Well, that that's the best thing. We'll stop there. I think that's a lovely, th lovely way to leave people. And I would, I would, and you can, uh, I'm going to speak for you here, Shota K, but I, I can say if anybody's listened to this and you have, and you're not sure anybody will listen to you or you have questions and you think nobody's here to listen myself, you can you can message me and you can message Shota K on Facebook and just ask a question. We're nice people and we'll respond. So <laughs> if you feel like you have if if suicide or things like this are are on your mind and you have issues with it or it's in your family and you just feel like there's no one else you can talk to, there's two people right here on this screen who we may be total strangers to you, but will at least respond to a Facebook message of, "Hey, I hear you. I'm here to help." Um, so. I hope that's okay to speak for you on that behalf, Shota K. I mean, I, I feel like sometimes personal reach outs are often the first step um, to empowering someone to feel like they can get professional help. Um, well, that's interesting that you say that because um, I, I have reached out to the TU Counseling Center. I have reached out to the National Institute of Mental Health of the mm -hmm. NIH mm -hmm. about this story and my journey and trying to find ways to maximize it. So this form of advocacy is becoming a, a part of my professional development at 43 years old. So um, I'm already trying to do the work. So it's all good. All right, man. Well, listen, 
Much love to you. Thank you so much for your time today. I really, I like I said, I took copious notes, and I have lots of uh, researching I now have to do, and I have a, a building wave of guilt over, over my ignorance of Biz Marquis, given that I grew up on his music so much. <laughs> so um, I'll go dig deeper on that. But but Shota K, thank you so much for your time. Stay healthy, and I can't wait to to. I can't wait to feel like I'm flying as close to the sun as I've ever flown before playing music with you again. <laughs> you mean with uh, extremes? Yeah. Extremes, yeah, yeah. If that's what happened on extremes, I, where I think we all better gird our loins for when you hop in on any other tunes we play. So I'm, I'm really, <laughs> I'm really pumped. But man, I, I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you, Josh. Same to you. Okay, I hope you enjoyed that conversation. This podcast is brought to you by Liquid Drum, liquiddrum.com down in Waco, Texas. Uh, my good friend Todd Meehan runs an amazing percussion company down there. Great merch, great content. Check him out, liquiddrum.com. Also, Kyle Dunleavy, dunleavypans.com, D-U-N-L-E-A-V-Y pans.com. Kyle Dunleavy makes and builds all the steel drums that I perform and teach on uh, in so percussion as well as at NYU and Princeton. Uh, he's an amazing, amazing tuner builder, um, just a really nice guy, very dependable. Check him out. If you are interested at all in steel pan advocacy, uh, want to learn more about the goings-on uh, in pan in Brooklyn, check out paninmotion.com. My good friend Kendall Williams, uh, Jerry Guy, Trisha Guy, and uh, Arisha John run an amazing organization called paninmotion.com. Check him out. And finally, Aleandre Mirage runs an amazing uh, clothing apparel company in Brooklyn that is steel pan centric. You can check him out at mango chow, C H O W clothing.com. I own a bunch of his shirts. They're amazing, very stylish, uh, beautiful, beautifully made. Check them out. Mango chow clothing.com. Okay, hope you're well. Talk to you soon. Bye.